G'day mate, 40 here. We're at Manly, going on a walkabout. So, been listening to some of Mark Shapiro's lectures on Zacharia Frankel. He might be considered the founder of conservative Judaism. And uh, Mark Shapiro says he was a greater scholar than Abraham Geiger, who may be considered the founder of Reform Judaism and a greater scholar than Shimshon Raphael Hirsch might be considered the founder of modern Orthodox Judaism. So all three of the modern denominations of Judaism got their denominational start in Germany in the 19th century. So Zacharia Frankel, he wasn't a left-winger like Abraham Geiger in the Reform. He regarded himself as a creator of the historical positive school. <laughs> so he saw Judaism as you know, developed over time rather than just you know, dropped by God from man to Mount Sinai 3200 years ago. And he also took a positive perspective on it rather than the more critical perspective of reform. So somehow that historical positive moniker didn't really take off Better watch ourselves here at the, the Police Institute. So, Mark Shapiro notes that uh, all the modern movements of Judaism, they all regard themselves as carrying the mantle of the Pharisees. So, from a non-Jewish perspective, right, the Pharisees are supposed to be the bad guys from the perspective of the New Testament and Christianity. The Pharisees are legalistic and small-minded and, and petty. But from a Jewish perspective, like all one Jewish denominations, they carry the mantle of the Pharisees. From a Jewish perspective, the Pharisees are dynamic and creative adapting uh, Judaism to changing times. And Mark Shapiro talks about finding a couple of posegs from 18th and 19th century who are A-OK -okay with, with counting women in a minion, a prayer minion. That's a quorum of 10 males traditionally to constitute a minion to be able to say certain prayers. And Mark Shapiro pointed it out to his Harvard professor, Zdor Tversky, and said how radical this was. And Dr. Tversky said, what determines whether something is radical or not is time. Right? Time and space, community, situation. That right? situation changes things, whether they're considered radical or acceptable. So there are a whole bunch of beliefs that are totally unacceptable today, but were acceptable 120 years ago. Okay, so 120 years ago, Jews were regarded as a race, right? There was race science. People felt good about their race, including white people, and times have change. That's no longer socially acceptable. So. You want to form some kind of identitarian movement, you're going to be isolated, rejected, marginalized, persecuted if you're white and you try to do it on the basis of white racial identity. But if you do it on the basis of Christianity, then it's much less controversial. So instead of talking about race, you just talk about Christ as King. And you see, this is the approach taken by Nick Fuentes and uh, Godwood and you know, a whole bunch of other dissident right thinkers. They realize that there's no, no future in an explicitly racial identity. Uh, you have to, have to fit your cause into the mantle of what works. So just like all Jewish denominations, 
situate themselves under the mantle of the Pharisees. So two revolutionary movements of the 21st century are not going to usually be very successful if they come out and say we're revolutionary, right? Usually you're going to be more successful if you tie yourself into tradition some way. Like make the case that you're socially acceptable. So no one came along and said, oh, we're starting a new religion. People said, no, we're just fulfilling what's already here. We're just reforming what's already here. We're just you know, setting straight what's already here. And that's a formula that works. Like coming along straight out and saying, we're here to create a revolution, like Richard Spencer used to talk about, and that's a suicidal path. People don't want to sign on for that. Now, you can tie yourself into the past and practice eisegesis, right? Meaning, you read whatever meaning you desire into the past, into the text, even if it's not there. As opposed to exegesis, where you just try to deduce from the text what's there. So you can read meaning into it and still tie yourself into tradition. But you need a winning formula. Right? You need something that people can hold on to. You need to show that you've got some time-tested formula that uh, you're wired into the wisdom practice and rituals of the past. You can have a lot more success with that approach coming along saying, hey, we're going to change everything. So how much reforming can you do until you leave Orthodox Judaism? So one definition is that uh, Orthodox Jews accept the authority of the Shulchan Aruch, which is a 15th century four-volume compendium of Jewish law by Yosef Karo. And we don't always hold by the Shulchan Aruch today, right? Jewish law has adapted and changed since the issuing of the Shulchan Aruch, but if you explicitly come out and say that you're jettisoning the Shulchan Aruch, then that's going to leave you outside of Orthodox Judaism. Now, what you need to do, if you're going to work within a system, within a group, within a tradition, within a community, within a people, you have to get other people to sign on. So if you just unilaterally abrogate the Shulchan Aruch, right, you're not going to have any pull within Orthodox Judaism. But if you can phrase things in a way that uh, garners support from many other members of your group, right, your fellow Orthodox Jews or whoever your group is, then you're much more likely to be successful. Now, many people in dissident movements don't really want to be successful. They just want to feel as though they're edgy. They just want to feel important. Right? They're just in it for the feels. They, they, they prefer to live in their delusions rather than in reality. And so those people are going to be successful. But if you're going to be successful with your group, your cause, reforming your people, your tradition, your, your religion, your nation's politics. You have to get others to sign on. And usually there are far more effective ways than directly trying to recruit people to your cause. Like if you can subtly insinuate that uh, they came up with it on their own, they made their own journey to where you're at. And, People can change effortlessly if they feel that they have agency and they are the force behind the change. But if you directly try to change people, they always resist. So it's not as easy getting communal support, right? As people 
find it a lot easier to just go it alone. I have a lot more freedom, a lot more ease, but your work doesn't have as much resonance. You're much more likely to get ignored. So this would also apply to my father. My father tried to reform the Seventh-day Adventist Church without gathering sufficient support among the administrators who had the power to bring about these changes. And so even though he privately got many scholars or had many scholars on his side, the administrators, the people who had the power, this, the canny sophisticated political players in the church did not sign on. And in the end, Seventh Adventist Church rejected my father and rejected his reform of the message. And uh, Seventh Adventism is more traditional and distinctive and gone in the very opposite direction of my father's teachings. And my father is being left to the sidelines. So that's what usually happens if you pay no mind to your level of support. You pay no mind to you know, recruiting people using subtlety and flattery and care and compassion, right? Then you're going to have a lot more success than if you just try to bulldoze people or if you're just so sure that you're right, then people aren't going to listen to you. So we pretty much do everything with the consent of the community. And once you arouse enough opposition, right, you're going to be flattened. I mean, Richard Spence was a strong guy, but after the Hellgate controversy, he fought, so he was flattened. In fact, the cumulative toll of the hatred directed towards him has shifted him back into a mainstream perspective from 2020 on. So he just can't take living on the outskirts of society any longer. Right? It's very painful to be rejected by society in the subject of tremendous opprobrium. It's a lot easier to work within the society, but it requires a, a discipline. It requires a self-abnegation. It requires and taking other people's feelings into consideration. And for some people, this is natural. Like for healthy people, this is natural. Right? If you're one of those people who naturally moves towards people rather than away or against, right? then taking other people's feelings into consideration will come naturally. You'll be much more socially successful. But if you are by inclination someone who moves away from people, moves against people like my father and me through much of our lives we've been much more naturally inclined to move away from people or against people rather than toward people so that largely accounts for our social failures now you can form relationships particularly with a spouse and I think with my my mother and that helped to moderate my father's tendencies to move against and to move away from people. And so those, those tendencies were muted. He learned to move with people, move towards people, and you know, got along socially much better. But when she died, then Uh, you know, his life was thrown into turmoil and you know, moving away from people and moving against people became stronger and stronger though I'm sure my stepmother at times was a moderating influence in ways in the end the tendency to move away just became dominant he got kicked out of the church's ministry so a formula for social success is move towards people, move towards the traditions that they love, the practices that they love, the interpretations that they love, and then seek to update them or modify them or slightly redirect them in a direction that is congenial with people, and then you'll be able to build a following and a much more effective 
social movement.